The following program sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts. About Money, a different approach to investing you won't hear anywhere else. Your host, Mike Adams, is a registered investment advisor and works with investment portfolios exceeding over $100,000 in net worth and has a proven track record of managing long-term investments surpassing the markets in the long term. The information shared on the following program is for educational purposes only and any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. And now, here's Mike. It's Thursday afternoon, or it could be Friday, it could be Saturday, depending upon what you're listening to. We're live here on Thursday, talking about money. Got a lot to talk about today. You know, at one time, the withdrawal rate from funds when people retired was 5%. And then in the mid-90s, it became 4%. And today, it's now 3%. Well, how come? It used to be 5 now it's 4 now it's 3 so what gives? We're going to talk about that later in the program. I've got a great guest who is in an industry which is going through some significant changes. And he's got a great story to tell. He has a great company, founded a company. You want to hear what, what he has to say. But I want to start. I want to start with a Frenchman by the name of André Francois Raffray. Back in 1965, Raffray thought he had made... An incredible deal, the deal of a lifetime. It was a 47-year-old attorney, and he made a deal to buy an apartment from a widow. She was living in Arles, and he wanted to buy it on viage. On viage means in life. It was a French system where, in his case, he was going to pay $500 a month as long as she lived. And she was going to continue to live in the house. But the condition was that part of her will would be to leave the house, or actually it was an apartment, leave the apartment to him when she died. Very, very normal concept in France. We'll talk a little more about that. But the idea was when she died and she was 90 years old, he would then take possession of of this apartment. Now, the woman, the widow, was Jean Louise Camel. She was 90 years old. Born on February 21st, 1875. That's a year before Alexander Graham Bell patented the telephone. 14 years before André Gustave Eiffel built his tower in Paris. Now, her father owned a store in Arles, and he sold different supplies. He used to sell colored pencils and pastels and things to Vincent van Gogh. Van Gogh, if you're, if you're Dutch, van Gogh. And Jean Louise Kaman rem remembered him as somebody she thought was very ugly, very impolite, sick, and he, he smelled. In fact, around our, she said they called him Loco. <clears throat> now, she herself married a cousin, Fernand Nicolas Cummins, so she didn't even have to change her last name. She married a cousin. And in this deal that Raffray made, it was en viage. In French, it was a way for older people to have a retirement income. You know, in the U.S., we, we created Social Security in the 1930s, but it wasn't until 1975 that the French created a retirement Social Security system. So, Envoy via, Viage was a way in which couples or individuals could live in their house and receive an income, and they could live there as long as they lived until they had until they face death, and then it would go over to the other person. So poor Rafa, he was paying 500 a month. He thought he had a great deal. But Jean Louise Kaman went on to become the oldest living person in the world. She lived an additional 32 years. She lived until age 122. 
she rode a bicycle until she was over 100 years old. She lived through 17 French presidents. André Francois, however, died at the age of 77. She outlived him. He never got to live in that apartment that he made the arrangement for. Over the period of time that she lived, they paid a total of $184,000 for an apartment that in 1965 they could have bought if they had the cash for less than 90000 So they paid more than twice what it was worth. But she continued to live during the entire time. No, it was his wife who went on to outlive Jean-Louise Comment, his wife, actually did move into the apartment. But during the time that the, that the attorney was alive, so was the widow. You know, and it brings us to the point, one of the great issues facing today, facing older people today and funding today, is underestimating how long all of us are going to live. It's a significant issue. Every year, the people who turn 65 are facing the fact that they're going to have a life expectancy three months longer than the people that turned 65 the year before. Think about that. Every four years, the people that turn 65 are going to have a life expectancy of an additional year. That's what's happening. In the beginning, if you go back, I don't know, 30 or 40 years ago, 50 years ago, when life expectancy began to increase, it was because we had less infant mortality. But today, it's because we're living longer. We're living much longer. The fastest growing segment of our population are the people that are 100 years or older. Fastest growing segment. There used to be a television show in the 50s, in the, maybe in the 40s and 60s too. I don't, don't remember that far back. In fact, some of that time was before my birth. But anyway, uh, there used to be a television, sh- tele- television show called Queen for a Day. And every day when there was someone who turned 100 years of age, they would announce the name of that person on the show. There were so few people turning 100 that they would announce it on that show. Today, almost everyone knows someone who's at least one person who's 100 years old. And maybe two or three or four. It's a way that we're seeing a growing population. You know, and the photo, if you look at what's going on right now, Four out of 10 Americans will reach retirement age with no savings. Social Security supplies about 40% of income, so that leaves a shortfall of about 60%. And the average person in the U.S., those people who don't have the income, will tend to make it up by working for a lot of their life, the rest of their life. So when people are hitting 65 years of age, a number of those people are continuing to work. That's a significant issue. Some of it is a healthy issue because it's, you can show that people live longer if they're working past the age of 65. But part of the problem is not being able to take it easy and retire at the age of 65. 45% of men polled that are in their 50s and in their 60s said that they plan to continue to work past retirement age. 45% of men say that they intend to work past retirement age. For some of them, it's an option that they have and they want to do. But for some, it's a requirement. If you look at where we are, and there's been such a big focus with Trump care and the Republicans' trying to repeal Obamacare and replace it with something else. The, it, the focus has been on young people who are going to lose 
their premium, lose their their insurance, and on older seniors who are going to see their premiums rise. Many of those seniors are living on Social Security. Health care is a factor in retirement. In the olden days, there used to be the defined benefit programs that companies had where they paid up to 80% of salary plus add Social Security, and you had a pretty good life. Today, that doesn't exist. Today, most retirement plans, most 401ks, supply almost at a maximum 40%, not 80%. So add 20% Social Security, and you've still got a 40% shortfall. And while spending tends to reduce as people get older, it reduces in only two areas, and that's, or it reduces in all areas except for two. One is transportation, and one's health care. And everyone knows someone who needs health care. Making the choice between living healthy or unhealthy because you can afford or not afford it is going to become a more and more significant problem. There was a, fi- a study that was done that was, was featured in Barron's, a fidelity study, that said people that just have Medicare from the age of 65 are going to need $260,000 between then and death. We'll come back to this right after the commercial break. Don't go away. We've got more to say. About Money with Mike Adams will resume in a moment on Business Radio 1300 KKOL. For more information, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Did you know the 20-year annualized S&P return was 8.19%, while the 20-year annualized return for the average equity mutual fund investor was just 4.67%? That's a gap of 3.52%. It doesn't sound like much now, but it could mean the difference between retiring in comfort and running out of money. For some seniors, a gap that large could cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars and cut their retirement short. Don't run out of money. Call Mike Adams of Adams Financial Concepts today, 206-903-1019, and learn more about how you can, one, create wealth for retirement, and two, protect yourself from running out of money. Adams Financial Concepts specializes in creating and maintaining wealth. Call today, 206-903-1019, or log on to adamsfinancialconcepts.com. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Winning. We're back with more about money. For details on what you hear on today's show, visit AdamsFinancialConcepts.com. Now, here again is Mike Adams. I've been talking about some of the issues that are facing us as we grow older. Financial issues, because it's a, a very major concern, is that as we grow older, we are not only growing older, but we're living for a longer and longer period of time. And as we live longer, the medical costs are going to increase. Transportation costs are going to increase. But it's not proportional either, because as we get older, as we get into our 70s, our 80s, our 90s, we tend to be more healthy during that time. For the people that are living the longest, they tend to be much, much healthier. I mentioned the oldest living person in the world at the beginning of the program, Jean-Louise Comment of France, and she was riding a bicycle up until age 100. She said at age 100, she was probably going to have to give up smoking, too. Uh, This is a woman that walked, that did her shopping, took her panier, her little basket, went to the store, did her, her grocery stopping, store to store. And she did that for decades and decades, even into her early 100s. She was mobile. She was moving around. You know, health care needs begin to accelerate as health goes down and as we approach the very end of life. But that's when the spending comes in. And if you look at most financial plans, the idea is whether it's a a Monte Carlo simulation, which is based on a normal curve, which is a problem. I've already talked about that in the past. 
they talk about drawing down on principles so that your money lasts until you turn 100 years old. But if the fastest growing demographic is the 100 plus, a lot of people who are listening to this program will live it well into their 90s and some into their hundreds. And if the financial plan only looks forward to being age 100, drawing down principal in those last years is a time in which people need to ramp up health care spending. A focus, even using generic drugs, there's cancer, there's MS, hepatitis C, those other drugs that are chronic, not biologics, but just generic drugs are expensive. Blood cancer, Replimid, $12,000 a year. It's not cheap. You know, and when you look at the cost of those drugs as we get older and older, there's no way of knowing today what the cost of those are going to be as we go forward. You know, one of the things that falls under a lot of insurance plans are cataract surgeries. And a lot of us will have cataract surgeries. No question about it. You can either do surgery or you can do it with laser. The cost of a laser, however, is generally not covered by most insurance policies, so it's an extra $1,500 per eye. So as we get older, as we move forward on these financial plans, many of the plans are not covering health care in those last years of life. When you add it all up, what the cost is from 65 just to 89 the cost just for medical care, forecasting and looking out, is almost eight hundred and sixty thousand dollars, sixty-five to eighty-nine. And for most of us that are listening to this program, we're going to live beyond that eighty-nine years of age. The average life expectancy for most people listening to this radio program, the affluent, and I assume fairly well off people, most of the people who are listening are going to live and have a life expectancy already well into their 90s. If we only get to 90, you're looking at having medical cost of 860000 And in the next 10 years after that, at least that amount again medical cost, $2 million. That's something that's not in most financial plans. Most financial plans show you some drawdown in those last years. That is dangerous, in my opinion. That's extremely dangerous. I think there's a way around that. I think there's ways in which financial plans can be restructured but that's a whole different subject, too. You know, we're living a lot longer, and there's some real positive benefits to that. We're seeing people with second careers. We're seeing people enjoy their 60s, their 70s, their 80s. They're traveling. They're hiking. They're skiing. They're doing all those activities and living a very good life. I just want for my clients that that continues until the end of age, until the end of life, and not reach the point in their late 90s that they're worried about, do I have to sell peanuts at a Mariners game to make my rent? That's not the way I want to spend my late 90s. I hope it's not the way you will. Anyway, I want to bring us... Out of that, I want to talk about my guest today, a very interesting name company. It's called Ghost Fish Brewing Company. My guest today is Brian Thiel. Welcome to the program, Brian. Thank you, Mike. Happy to be here. So why don't we start with your background? Sure. Uh, My personal background uh, is really from the manufacturing side of of, of business. Uh, I spent about 25 years working for two of the world's largest aluminum can manufacturers, 
Um, and, and from that time and the experience that I gained uh, working many different types of, of jobs within those companies um, really allowed me to see a great insight into the brewing industry. Um, and um, I, throughout my career, I worked with many of the large, um, what I call macro breweries today around the, the United States, as well as many of the smaller craft breweries around the United States, including some of the <coughs> ones that are well known here in the Seattle area. And so how did you put together, along with your partners, Ghost Fish? And tell us about your partners, too. Yeah, so uh, I have uh, two, uh, two business partners that are active in the business. Uh, Jason Yerger is our head brewer. I'm um, really the magician behind the curtain, um, although he doesn't stay behind the curtain, <laughs> thankfully for us. And uh, my second partner is Randy Schrader. Actually, Randy, uh, first of all, he handles the operation side of things. And Randy and myself are really the co-founders of this concept of ghost fish brewing. Um, as I like to share the story of the, the, the beginning origins of ghost fish brewing, uh, way before we had the name, way before we were actually brewing beer, and it was just two guys probably sharing beers and talking about beer. Um, what I what I say, doing all the fun things, um, you know, like coming up with names of the bre- the beers and the brewery and stuff like that. Somebody had the idea to open up a brewery, and uh, it could have been Randy, could have been myself. Uh, it doesn't really matter uh, much, other than the fact that the other person never said no to that idea. And that idea just kept growing and a little wind behind our sails. And before we knew it, a couple months into it, we were starting to plan a legitimate uh, business, uh, put together a legitimate business plan to open up a brewery. Uh, The problem with with that um, plan was that neither Randy or myself are really uh, accomplished brewers. In fact, I would say there were maybe uh, my skills are below novice. (laughs) I don't want to speak for Randy. Uh, so we knew at that time that we would need to find somebody to brew the beer. Um, so we continued on, and um, we actually had a came to a point in the time of the history of this of this company, or the beginning of this company, in terms of where we made a decision. With my background working alongside craft breweries, I could see the trends. Now this goes back to about 2012, 2013, which at that time in the United States, there were approximately 2,000 to 2,500 licensed craft breweries across the United States. Um, so, and the trends were showing that these were going to be growing significantly over the next couple of years. So, um, my wife had been diagnosed with celiac disease um, right now about 10 years ago. And so, uh, when I was working my previous job um, with one of the ca- aluminum can manufacturers, she often would go with me and we'd visit a lot of my customers, which were craft breweries. And uh, my wife would, would really be on the sideline from when I say that, I mean by in terms of not being able to enjoy the craft beer because of her gluten intolerance. And um, it was a, a trip to the Great American Beer Festival, um, which takes place every year in Denver, that uh, we got to sample all the gluten-free beers that were there uh, for my, on behalf of my wife, uh, as well as a lot of the other beers, and uh, came back and pitched this idea to my business partner, Randy, that uh, perhaps... W- we have the opportunity to do something that's never been done before. And and by that was to start a dedicated gluten-free brewery done in the vein of craft breweries. Um, So say that again. Yeah. So, uh, so basically by that, what I mean in terms of is that there were gluten-free beers on the marketplace that in my opinion uh, were mass produced, uh, didn't really put much emphasis on flavor and taste and really the craftsmanship that goes into today's, local craft beers and so uh, we felt it was possible to to produce a product that had those same uh, characteristics we just need to find the right person and fortunately for us that person was jason as i mentioned before who happened to be living down in the 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 san francisco uh, area and um, we were able to woo him up here to seattle uh, which was not difficult Uh, he (laughs) wanted to move here anyways and um and so that's really how the three of us came together to, uh, to form Ghost Fish Brewing, and as well as being a dedicated gluten-free brewery. That's a great story. We're going to come back after the commercial break and talk about when the Ghost Fish name. But we also want to talk about a number of other issues that, that we talked about once before, about aluminum cans versus bottles, about Ghost Fish. 
and how you're marketing and where you are. And we're going to be coming back right after the commercial break. So don't go away. We've got more to talk about and more to finish up about 5%, 4%, or 3%. Be right back. More about money coming up with Mike Adams on Business Radio 1300 KKOL. For more information, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Creating and maintaining wealth has been the specialty of Adams Financial Concepts for over 20 years. Every portfolio managed by Adams Financial Concepts is customized to fit each particular client's objectives and risk tolerance. The client's interest always comes first in portfolio decisions. Call Mike Adams today at 206-903-1019 or log on to adamsfinancialconcepts.com to check out their AFC performance. They welcome your review. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. KKOL. Now we return to About Money. There's more information waiting for you at adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Here again is your host, Mike Adams. So I'm here with Brian Thiel of Ghost Fish Brewing Company. We started talking about the background, getting up to, to Ghost Fish, but let's talk about Ghost Fish itself. I'll leave it to you. Thanks, Mike. So we opened our doors uh, February of 2015. Um, we have uh, a 15 barrel brew house, which for those that may not be familiar, uh, a barrel of beer is uh, a barrelage is what's the uh, quantity kind of uh, terminology in, in brewing and stuff. And that equates one barrel equates to about 31 gallons. So when we brew one batch of beer on our system, we're brewing about 500 gallons of beer. So we started out uh, brewing our first batch uh, December of 20. 14 and uh, open the doors um, and uh, quite frankly have had uh, uh, lots of great success uh, quick growth um, which um, is great but uh, obviously along with uh, quick growth you know it's uh, there's obviously some growing pains that can come along with that so uh, we've just grown very fast and uh, and really focused on trying to make sure that uh, the beer quality is the best it can be making sure that we've got uh, a strong foundation for our business. Um, and uh, with that, we've also hired a lot more people than what we originally thought. So uh, <laughs> growth can be a great thing, but uh, as long as you're prepared for it, um, as cash flow is always an important piece of any business. So let's talk about the beer itself. You sure. mentioned gluten-free. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of beers that claim they're gluten-free. Yeah, there's a what I call a very mis misfortunate uh, situation that exists in uh, today's uh, beer world. And that is uh, there are people that are making um, what's called a gluten reduced beer. Um, that's really made with ingredients that contain gluten like barley, wheat, and rye. And uh, they basically add an enzyme that was uh, designed to remove uh, chill or haze, which basically is suspended yeast that's left in the, in the, uh, the in the, from the brewing process which makes the beer cloudy. Go ahead. Explain the, the yeast that's left from the brewing process. Yeah, the, the, the yeast that's left, um, it, you know, it's, its purpose, obviously, is to convert sugars to alcohol. And so once, the, once anybody that brews beer, you know, monitors that process, and when the beer reaches, you know, the right uh, levels um, that they're looking for in terms of, then basically they, the, the process is called crashing the beer. And so that's basically lowering the temperature uh, to a point where the, the yeast really stops activating. It stops converting sugars to alcohol. And um, any, that's why the kind of the hallmark of craft beer is that typically it's going to be, um, in, in terms of visuals, it's going to be more cloudy. Um, it's not going to be crystal clear like some of the, the, the um, mass produced beers that, you know, that we see on the marketplace. Um, it tends not to add much, you know, to change the flavor profile, but it can, depending on the amount of yeast that's left in there. So back to these breweries that uh, are making gluten reduced beer. Basically, they've uh, there was there is an enzyme that exists to, to remove this yeast, and somebody figured out that it could also remove some, but not all of the gluten proteins. And for people who are gluten intolerant or celiac, like my wife. Um, it really is about the, the, the proteins within gluten that causes the damage within the, the lower intestines. And so um, 
these beers that are on the marketplace uh, are not legally allowed to call themselves gluten-free. Uh, but quite frankly, they don't really do much to stop distributors or retailers um, or marketers from putting them into the gluten-free category. On the other side of the spectrum, um, which is what we do, is 100% gluten-free. So we begin with grains that naturally contain no gluten. Uh, our processes are exactly the same as traditional brewing that's existed around the world for, for centuries um, in the sense that we brew primarily with all grain. We happen to use grains, again, that, that contain no, no gluten naturally, things like millet, buckwheat, and rice, uh, many of which of these grains are, are grown throughout you know, our great state of Washington here. Um, in fact, Washington, little known fact, is the leading exporter of buckwheat. Uh -huh. So um, right now, our grains come from out of state, from Colorado, Nebraska. Um, but uh, so our grains are also malted, which is a process basically that uh, um, starts the, um, the sprouting process of grains where they start to release sugar and then... Um, at some point, heat is added to stop the malting process because we it's the, the sugars within the grains that basically the brewers are after. And so um, all of our grains are also roasted, um, similar to roasting coffee. Um, and that's what really gives it the great flavor. And that's why we at Ghost Fish are able to do so many different uh, beer styles um, that because we're using some really high-end, high-quality um, grains that uh, are both malted and roasted. And that's not something that you'll find in a lot of other gluten-free beers. So what's the cost differential with the grains you're using versus the normal grains that are used in beer? Yeah, that's a great question, Mike. So one of our biggest challenges going into this project um, with, a, with a lofty goal of being the best in the gluten-free beer category um, and the path that we chose in terms of this grain is that uh, we knew going into it that there was significant cost to do this, just simply because there's not a lot of uh, producers of there's there's producers there's just not a lot of companies that can do the malting and roasting processing that needs to take place for us to be able to use them in the way that we do. So, generally speaking, most breweries would pay somewhere south of thirty cents a pound for their malted and roasted barley, which is the the staple of most uh, beers. Uh, by comparison, our least expensive grain um, runs us about eighty cents a pound, um, and we have grain costs that uh, the, the, some of the grains that we really like to use in some of our um, most flavorful beers would be closer to a dollar eighty or even somewhere north of two two dollars a pound. So as you can see, there's quite a difference between thirty cents a pound and two dollars a pound. Um, and our biggest challenge was not with that um, front end cost being so high not wanting to create a product that would essentially price us out of the craft beer buyer market. So today we're at the higher end of craft beer. Um, we feel like um, that is where we need to be. It's difficult because a lot of people don't have this background in terms of what our cost structure is, you know, when they're at standing in front of the the beer section making choices of what to buy and they see a price tag that's at the higher end versus something that's at the lower end. But we feel like our quality stands out and people who have tried our beers, you know, understand in terms of that uh, there's, this is a higher process. This is a, this is something different that doesn't exist in the market. So, um, but, but yeah, that's, that's, that's a significant uh, piece of our business. You know, over the years I've done a number of programs with a number of companies and the companies that survive the longest time are not the ones with the cheapest price. They're the ones with the highest quality. And they delivered the, a price equivalent to the quality that they, they produce. So it, it makes sense in your case to be at the high end. So let me, I want to go back. You, you came out of the aluminum canned industry. Correct. So why cans versus bottles or why bottles versus cans? What, what's the difference between the two? Well, with that setup, I'm sure that uh, some of your audience is probably going to, to sense some bias in terms of what I'm about to say. But uh, actually, from, a, from a, uh, a beer producer standpoint, the can, the aluminum can, actually is the best package for beer. And the reason for that is that 
there are two main enemies of beer, um, one of which is light and the other is oxygen. Um, so those two things can create the most damage in, of beer, uh, more so than anything else. I mean, unless you've got some type of a bacterial proper, pro, uh, problem or something like that. But if you've got good beer and then you're packaging it, those two things after the packaging process could be the most detrimental. So for the glass bottles, which typically are, you know, you'll see them, you know, dark color, dark green, dark brown. The reason for that is that they're trying to, to block as much of the light in there. But even the dark colored beer bottles allow light in. And then the caps on the beer bottles, um, studies um, have proven, research has shown that even within a couple of hours that uh, even a good seal on a bottle cap, on a glass bottle, you'll start to let little small amounts of oxygen in. Aluminum cans on the other, si on the other side uh, do not let any light in. So it produces a, a, a light-free barrier, as well as um, the seal on cans is the integrity is much stronger than the seal on a bottle cap to a glass bottle. So less oxygen, less light means a better product. And let's face it, in places like our great state of Washington, we can take cans to places that glass bottles can't. So for those that like to hike, bike, camp, fish, whatever, uh, packing in a bunch of cans that, uh, quite frankly, chill faster, allows you to continue to do what you like to do and take your favorite beer with you. So before we finish, tell us quickly where you're located, because you also have a brew pub. That's correct. Yes. Tell we us about we have about one minute, less than a minute to go. So tell us about the brew pub. Tell us the location. Sure. Yeah, we've got a great place uh, in the Soto, the heart of Soto area of Seattle. And so that's uh, southern downtown. We're at 2942 First Avenue South, about a block and a half south of the headquarters for Starbucks. And uh, we have a large 100 seat tap room, uh, a full kitchen restaurant, um, some a, a great friendly staff that's very knowledgeable about beer, uh, just a, a, a very welcoming environment. The actual the building itself was built in 1926. A lot of great architecture inside. So, for people that uh, you know like to, the aesthetic feel of wood and brick and and stone and things like that, with a lot of natural light, um, uh, it's just a really a fabulous place to, to to be and brew beer. Give us the address one more time. Sure, twenty nine forty two First Avenue South. Here On the in way Seattle. to the baseball stadium. Absolutely. We're going to be right back after the commercial break. Don't go away. Got more to talk about. Stay tuned. About Money returns in a moment with Mike Adams here on Business Radio 1300 KKOL. For more information, click on AdamsFinancialConcepts.com. How do you picture retirement? House on the beach, small farm in the country, traveling the world with your spouse. The one thing you don't picture is running out of money. Retirement dreams are shattered all too often by poor investment choices, sending many retirees back to work. If you think the job market is tough now, try entering it after you've retired. Don't run out of money. Start planning now. Call Mike Adams of Adams Financial Concepts today at 206-903-1019 and learn more about how you can create wealth for retirement and probably, most importantly, protect yourself from running out of money. Adams Financial Concepts specializes in creating and maintaining wealth. Call today, 206-903-1019, or log on to adamsfinancialconcepts.com. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Off the phone. About Money continues. Remember the website, adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Here's Mike. So I want to talk and finish off talking about this whole idea of how much money you should plan for in your retirement. How much of a withdrawal rate do you look at? Between 1926 and 1976, a period of 50 years, the withdrawal rate was figured at 5%. 5% seemed to be the right amount to draw out without running out of money. Now, part of the issue is people were not living as long as we do today. So that's part of the issue. And in 1994, William Bingen, a financial advisor, spent a lot of time looking history up and down 
markets, looked through everything, and he found there was no historical case that existed where a 4% withdrawal rate would exhaust a retirement account in anything less than 33 years. And you remember in 1994, we were not living quite as long as we are today. So 33 years seemed to be a reasonable thing. 33 years added to 65 put a person at 98 years of age. And so financial plans were built around that. If you look at a lot of financial plans, you'll see the financial plan will increase a little bit and then start to decline and run out of money around the age of 98 or 99 or 100. It all goes back to that study that was done in 1994. But as we've grown older, as our life expectancy has increased, where most of the people listening to this program are going to have a life expectancy of mid-90s. Mid-90s. That means half will die before 95, and half of the people living listening to this program are going to live beyond 95. If you then look at a, a financial plan which runs out of money at age 98 or 99, half the people are going to run out of money. Actually, a little less than half. Statistically, a few people will die before, before age 100. But a large, major, a large majority will live beyond. A large majority of that half that lived to 95. So what's going on? So the idea is maybe not 4%. Maybe it has to be 3%. And maybe because it has to be 3% or 3.5%, instead of needing 25 times your annual income, you need 30 or 35 times. And if you need 30 or 35 times, then you need to have more money for retirement. Having 25 times your normal amount of retirement funds is not going to get you through. Now you need 30 times or 35 times. That's what's going on. And that's based on looking at longevity. It's based on looking at returns. It's something that has been a focus of a lot of talk as baby boomers has reached retirement age. The baby boomers are driving a lot of discussion about retirement with retirement withdrawal rates and retirement strategies. But a lot of it revolves around the fact that returns are a lot lower than they have been in the past. I've done a number, of, a couple times, a program called 10 is the New Four. If you take the approach, and one of the things that we came out with, and over the last 20 years or 30 years we've talked about, is the, the pyramid the risk pyramid where you have very safe assets at the bottom and then less safe in the middle and then you have your 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 aggressive investments at the very top of the pyramid and you should have according to the theory most of your assets in the very safe and a few at the very top of the pyramid so what you have is very safe assets yielding 1 to 2% Medium safety assets, Neil Lake Ponds, yielding 4%. And then you have your stocks at the very top, yielding 9%. So what does that do? It means if you have 50% at 1% and 30% at 4% and 20% at 9%, it means the total return is a whole lot less. If you go back to parents' days, when they had a defined benefit plan. Defined benefit plans were invested primarily in stocks. Not the bottom two things that we talked about, but at the very top. And the returns were significantly higher than the plans that we see today. And because they had significantly higher returns, they had a significantly higher amount of retirement funds that they could draw upon. Today, when you look at a 1% difference, that's 17% difference in 
the retirement nest egg. So if you reduce your returns by just 1%, you're going to have less, you're going to have 17% less money on retirement day than you, than you would have if you had 1% more. And if you have 2 or 3 or 4% more, think about what that does to retirement money. So when I say 10 is the new 4, the new mantra of the financial planning profession is you now need to save 10% of your income to have a safe amount when you retire. And even then, at that point, if you look at the financial plans, a number of those plans will show that you run out of money in the late 90s or at 100 years of age. We've moved away from this concept of the more aggressive assets into the more conservative assets, and the impact of that is you have to save more. Whereas our parents, for their defined benefit programs, were investing 4% to get to the same level, now you have to invest 10% to get that same level. That's, that's a crazy idea to me. That's, that's crazy. I believe that you need to be invested in those assets which get you close to the retirement levels you need. I believe you need to be on a more aggressive scale invested than on a conservative scale. Conservative may slow down the risk on a short-term basis, may make you feel a lot better about going through a 2008, 2009, but if you've got another 10 or 15 or 20 years to work, 2008, 2009 is going to be a distant memory by the time you get to retirement. But what's not going to be a distant memory is the amount of money you have when it comes time to retire. That's the difference between what's going on in the industry today and where we were with the fine benefit programs. Add to that. Add to that. Dalbar does a study, and they have looked at mutual fund investors over a period of 30 years. And the average mutual fund investor is getting a 3.69% return versus 11.11% for the standard and poor's. That means $100,000 invested 30 years ago will yield $296,000 invested in the standard and poor's. It's $2.3 million. And many of those investors are being advised by financial advisors. So not only are they not getting the very top risk, they're reducing that risk by decisions that they make. That's, that's where we are. There's a lot more to talk about, but we're going to have to wait for that for next week or the week after. Stay with me for the next few weeks. We've got a lot to talk about. We've got a lot of new guests coming as well. Thanks for Brian for being here. Do go visit Ghost Fish Brewing Company. Very fascinating concept. It is gluten-free all the way through. And have a great weekend. I'll be back next week to talk about money. You've been listening to About Money with Mike Adams, a registered investment advisor. If you'd like more information about what you heard today or about Mike's investment philosophy and strategy, or if you want Mike to evaluate your own portfolio, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. The information shared on the preceding program was for educational purposes only. And any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. Join us again for more About Money with Mike Adams here on Business Radio 1300 KKOL. The preceding program was sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts. Creating and maintaining wealth has been the specialty of Adams Financial Concepts for over 20 years. Every portfolio managed by Adams Financial Concepts is customized to fit each particular client's objectives and risk tolerance. The client's interest always comes first in portfolio decisions. Call Mike Adams today at 206-903-1019 or log on to adamsfinancialconcepts.com to check out their AFC performance. They welcome your review. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. The following program's